We watch and wait for Christ's coming. We light in candles of hope, peace, joy, and love, remembering the promises of God with prayer. First, we light the candle of hope. This week, we light the candle of peace. Hear Zechariah's song of hope for peace to the Christ child, a reading from Luke 1, 76 through 79, the message version. And you, my child, prophet of the highest, will go ahead of the master to prepare his ways, present the, author, the offer of salvation to his people, the forgiveness of their sins. Through the heartfelt mercies of our God, God's sunrise will break in upon us, shining on those in darkness, those sitting in the shadow of death, then showing us the way, one foot at a time, down the path of peace. Please take your hymnals, and we're going to sing just the first verse of number 737, Like a River Glorious. Number 737. Glad for Dan that's here, and they're going to ask him to present our special music. Dan?
Didn't I say last week, if you practice, you can be a piano player. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. After they arrived home with their newborn, firstborn baby, this uh, couple were... Uh, the, the wife was encouraging her husband to sort of bond with the child by saying, you know, maybe you should change the first diaper. And he declined and said, I'll do the next one. And uh, so a few hours later, she reminded him of what he had said. It was time to change the diaper again. And he sort of looked at her with sort of a confused look on his face. And then he realized what he was saying and what she had said. And he replied by saying, I didn't mean the next diaper. I meant the next baby. <laughs> so it didn't work for me when I tried that one. So, but uh, Chicago Cubs uh, second baseman Ryan Sandberg was inducted into the Hall of Fame. He gave a speech. He wowed the crowd of about 28,000 that were there in Cooperstown. And uh, he talked about some of the tales of what it was to be a big uh, life in baseball and, and uh, some of the virtues, some of the respect, the respect of all the good things that were a part of that and also some of the humor. In the midst of his speech, he almost seemed like he, he broke down and sort of stopped talking about himself and he choked up and he said, the second best thing that ever happened to me was being inducted into the Hall of Fame. The first best thing that ever happened to me was my wife. And he said, she is my best friend. She is the love of my life. She's everything that's good about life. And I thank her for entering into my life at that time when I needed her the most. You know, over the course of over 45 years of pastoral ministry, I've had the opportunity to perform a few weddings. Not sure exactly the number, whether it's 100 or 150 or couples, but I can't think a single one of them that have ever not thought the same way. That uh, meeting them usually in premarital counseling with them and the, uh, the glow that is a part of that and looking forward to it that they didn't have that on, that on their faces the same idea of the sense of significance, that dream of having the kind of marriage that Ryan Sandberg is talking about. All of them began with a dream. All of them began with a plan of having not just a, a surviving marriage, but a Hall of Fame marriage, one of the great marriages, the kind of friendship that brings out the very best in each other and the kind of bond that allows two of them to face any kind of adversity that uh, will happen, the kind of union that produces something larger than just two people, but it's the sum of those two parts, the kind of marriage that that you hope that your grandchildren, your neighbors, and others would say, Lord, let me have a marriage like that. There's something valuable to be learned from this couple that we meet here in the Christmas story. I think there's something valuable here for us that I think is beneficial, can help us and uh, to make a difference now and later or can enable us to speak wisely into the lives of people around us. I'll give it to you this way. When you got married, did you say to God, you are free to change our plans to whatever you want us to do? Well, it's interesting. You wonder if that's what happened to Mary and Joseph. First of all, number one, things look bad. We're exa not exactly sure what their hopes and their dreams were when they got married and they first came together and decided to uh, come as a, become a man and wife. Uh, the way marriage took place back in that time frame is that it was a tr probably a, a year of, of, uh, uh, of their before marriage took place and uh, their uh, that that time frame and and uh, things uh, things appear to during that time frame to have gone wrong um, and maybe that's the first thing they have to teach us uh, 
that even in this time of, uh, of waiting, uh, that they were considered to be man and wife. And as hard as it can be to face it, it's really, really important to admit when things are looking bad. Look at verse 18 of chapter 1. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, in other words, before they had intimate relations, Mary was found to be with child. It doesn't get badder than that. It doesn't get badder than the aspect of an appearance or an experience of infidelity. And Joseph might have, might have said, well, Mary, it's your fault. And Mary might have responded, no, this is the whole thing. This whole thing's bigger than me, Joe. You don't understand. But sooner or later, they had to admit that something about the original plan, the original vision, has certainly now been changed. And I think it's at this point that uh, we learned the second valuable thing about marriage from the story of Christmas. We got to admit that when things look bad and it's going bad, but second, we can remember when it's gone bad from better to worse or going that way, that we also have number two options. And like Joseph, we have to consider our options. One of those options is divorce, and the option in divorce is that we can do it different ways. One is to divorce loudly, as many do. Nobody in that village would have blamed Joseph if he had chosen to do that, if he had stood on the street corner and announced it. That if he had left his betrothed spouse and who had obviously been unfaithful, and Matthew 5 says that even God allows for divorce under those conditions. Joseph could so easily have said, I give up. Okay, you win. You've done it. You win. I lose. But uh, you're going to pay and you're going to feel the disgrace. You're going to feel the pain like I have. And Mary could have done something like that, I suppose. She could have easily responded, Joe, you never could handle the truth. You never did listen. You always thought it was all about you. You never can see the larger picture, so I give up. You go if you're going to go if you want to. Sound familiar? Because there's a second idea, another option in divorce is divorce quietly. It takes more character to do that. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, meaning he was a person of character. He aligned with the character of God in great measure. Basically, he is a good Jew. He says, because Joseph was a righteous man and did not want to expose Mary to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And there are some couples that choose that path. Hey, didn't work out. Didn't work out. We tried. It just didn't go. Let's not shred each other. Let's not shred the kids. Let's not tear apart our friendship. Let's just part very quietly. You take the house in Nazareth. I'll take the donkey. You can have little Jesus at Christmas time. I'll get him at Passover. Let's just divorce quietly. And then thirdly, there is the idea of just divorcing secretly. It's many times that you can be in a church and not really know the health of a marriage of somebody else. Some couples, some couples hold hands because they're madly in love with one another. They're joined at the hip. Some couples hold hands because if they let go, they'll choke each other. Mary and Joseph could have just sort of shut it all down, kept up the appearances. I mean, they had family watching them and looking at them. And they could have sort of kept up the appearance. How many people in marriage simply just give up? Now, let's be clear. If you know anything about, and you do all know about Burton Baptist, you know that we believe in showing grace to those who have come to the end of their resources. If you know anything about this, the heartbeat of this church, you know that we believe in, a, in the God of second chances and a God of new beginnings. But the same God is also the God of restoring relationships 
and of fresh starts. And so I want to say that sometimes it's only when we come to the end of our dreams that God gives us his dream. And then we finally see what he wants. The Bible says that after Joseph had considered his options, an angel of the Lord came. Appeared to him in a dream, a messenger. The word in the Greek, angelos, means messenger in Greek. And the messenger uh, of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And verse 20, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. How much of the breakdown that happens in our lives is all about fear? Do not be afraid, because the angel says, what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will give birth to a son, and you are to be, a, in other words, Joseph, you are to be a part of this now. And you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin. In other words, what the angel is saying here is that the very circumstances, Joe, which you fear, spell you know, you look at them as they, you fear that they spell death to the relationship, when in actuality they are the beginning of salvation. Is it possible that we could find ourselves in a place so riddled with the death of our plans as we sort of want them to be, that we wouldn't understand that was where we had to get, we had to get to that point, so for God to create a new beginning that actually begins to work in our lives. And what looks like an impenetrable barrier today will become, if you lean in, if you lean in, it will become a bridge to a whole new aspect and season of blessing that can come into your life. And what is needed right now, and this is what God is trying to say to, to Joseph through this angel, is that you need, number three, a fresh faith and courageous obedience. A fresh faith and courageous obedience. What does that look like in practice for you and me? Sometimes it means that we go before God in prayer for our marriage. Sometimes we go before God in prayer for our relationships. I am thankful for my mother who cross-stitched Proverbs chapter 3 that we have hanging in our house. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, says the writer of Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. In other words, with faith and obedience acknowledge Him, and He then will direct your paths. In other words, ask God to do something supernatural to save both of you. And ask God and seek his guidance. And we seek his guidance through the avenues that he will then provide. You're all familiar with that verse in Jeremiah 29. The plans I have for you. It's interesting, the candle. Not about peace, but the other one that said to give you a hope. That Jesus' coming gives us hope. Let me close with this. In December, a number of years ago, a man named uh, Slats Grobnik, he sells Christmas trees in Chicago. He tells a story of one year when he met this couple that was out on the hunt for Christmas tree. And this particular couple, Slats remembers them. He says the guy was sort of skinny with a big Adam's apple that bulged out. She was kind of pretty, but two of them were wearing, you know, not the greatest clothes, ragged clothes, probably something that they'd got from Salvation Army. They didn't have much money, it was, it was clear to see. And so Slats walked around the Christmas tree yard there uh, along with them and uh, they found that most of the trees were going to be too expensive for anything that they could afford. And eventually they, they settled on a scotch pine that was okay on one side, but basically pretty bare on the other side. And then a little further along, they picked up another tree that hardly had any better. It looked like sort of a Charlie Brown type tree. And uh, I think it was half price of the half price for both trees. And so they took them. 
A few days later, uh, Slats is walking around in the, in the, on the street in the Chicago area, and what he happened to sort of glance through a picture window of an apartment and on the ground floor, and he saw this absolutely beautiful, spectacular tree. And it was a beautiful tree, full, thick, luscious, and when he was shocked, as he saw that the people that were in the house came into view in the window, and it was the couple that he had sold the trees to. So, curiosity got the best of him at that point. He went and knocked on the door, and sort of started up a conversation. And he had to know where they had got, where did you guys get that beautiful tree? And then they told them that when they had gotten home with all that they had, buying those two trees from him, that they had worked and worked to get those two trees and sort of where the branches were thin, they could weld in another and weave and one branch into interlacing with another and then they tied the two trunks together with wire. And, but over time, little bit by little by little in their effort and the grace of God, they found that they could overlap the branches and they now saw a tree that was thick and full to the point that you couldn't even see the wires. And Slats so looked at that with a smile and he says, so, so that's the secret? That you take two trees that aren't perfect, that might even be homely and maybe nobody else would want. But if you put them together in just the right way, and I would add with faith and obedience, then sometimes you can make something really, really beautiful. Do you think that's possible? What can God do with a man or woman willing to work in faith and obedience in a, into the dream of God, into his plan, and think of what is possible that he can do with that? Because the Gospels are speaking here of a plan that happened to real people in a real situation with Mary and Joseph. Because it's interesting, what did they say? Remember, Mary said... Let it be unto me according to your word. And in Matthew's gospel, Joseph woke up. He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife, and he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave the name Jesus. In other words, the name of this Savior who will still take imperfect people, with that grace and truth that he gives to us and binds them together and truly makes us truly beautiful as he binds us to himself so that we are fully and finally one in our obedience to God and following his wonderful plan. Is God free to change your plans? Let's go bow together in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this uh, wonderful story of what happened with Mary and Joseph and, and then their lives of committing themselves to you and then in raising the son, Jesus. And the effect that they had upon their lives and upon his life. And we recognize that at Christmas time to think of how our Savior has come. I pray for each one here. I pray for marriages. I pray for people. And in all this, that we desire that your plan would be done in our lives. And may we desire in every way to submit to you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for welding us together to you. And we thank you for the joy that is ours because of Christ and his coming. In Jesus' name. Amen.